Welcome to a radio show where we lay out the plain truth. It is a place where no conspiratorial rock will be left unturned, no mainstream propaganda will go unchallenged, and all existing reality boxes will be shattered. Piloting the discussion, as always, is the jet-setting international man of mystery, codenamed Plane. Co-piloting the storm clouds, along with them, are Time Monk veterans myself, Herm, the tea-drinking rabbit, Oolong, and other selected guests. This frequency is being broadcast across the secure Time Monk radio channels, direct to you for your listening pleasure. So, sit back, buckle your seatbelts, and ensure all overhead bins are secured, because we are most definitely in for a very turbulent ride. Tonight's topic will be about breakaway civilizations, and uh, take it away, Paul. Well, thank you, Herm. Um, I guess uh, many people are not really familiar with the idea of what a breakaway civilization might be. But uh, basically, it's the idea that uh, big money and big technology and... um, I guess you would say, institutions have come together, and they don't really feel like they're a part of the broader society. And I think a good starting point might be a quote from uh, a book called The Power Elite. Um, This was kind of um, the beginning of what might be called uh, uh, conspiracy thought back in the 1950s. It was by an author named C. Wright Mills. And uh, he said, We can readily understand why the power elite of America has no ideology and feels the need of none, why its rule is naked of ideas, its manipulation without attempted justification. It is this mindlessness of the powerful that is the true higher immorality of our time, for, with it, there is associated the organized irresponsibility that is today the most important characteristic of the American system of corporate power. And in that, um, I am really drawn to the idea of an organized irresponsibility. And I think that's kind of what we have in this breakaway civilization that's formed over the last hundred years or so. Um, They have too much technology and too much money for our own good. And uh, that's kind of the idea. It started a long time ago, and it's become so advanced that... um, Have you noticed that they've stolen trillions of dollars in the last decade or so, and we really have no idea where it went? Have a. I think uh, some people have noticed, but it does. It it doesn't seem like a lot of people have noticed enough to uh, make any difference at the polls, anyway. Well, it's not just a question of the polls. It's a question of where did the money go. Right? I mean, they stole trillions decades ago, and now they're stealing, you know, 10 trillion at a time or whatever. That's such an amazing amount of money that you have to ask where it could go. And so that segues into tonight's discussion. And uh, I thought a good start would be to go back to the 1800s. Um, uh, you might have heard of the airship mystery of 1897. Herm, Oolong, nope. have you heard of that? I, I have not. Okay. No, I don't think so. Not, not talking about the Hindenburg, that would have been after that. No, this is in the 1800s, 1897. Uh, there was a massive, I guess you would say, UFO wave across the United States, starting in California, going over to the Midwest, eventually ending in Texas. And it basically... Uh, one of them hit a windmill in Texas and blew up. And um, many, many believe these were aliens from trillions of miles away. Hello, are we there? Yep, yep. Was it so? It was a Zeppelin type airship they were flying, or was it like actually a like a metallic type craft? Some mix of metallic, but it was not a Zeppelin as we know it, and. Uh, Anyway, this was uh, a huge sign of where the world was going. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of sightings reported in papers throughout the United States. Uh, They tend to follow uh, railroad tracks, and they seemed to need water a lot, and they kept them along uh, railroad tracks for safety. And there were countless witnesses, and these were basically normal humans, And uh, sometimes they said 
where they were coming from and things like that. Uh, but basically, the story we get from a few uh, newspapers is that um, a professor at West Point, a professor at Tufts, and then seemingly a, uh, a guy from a German secret society were involved in this. And they were funded by what they said was uh, New York capitalists. And um, that professor at West Point went on to become the superintendent at West Point. So in this little story, we have, let's say, a six or nine month event. And um, it's hard to imagine a guy who becomes the head of West Point went AWOL, right? He was just doing what he was supposed to. And many thought that this was funded by Hearst. And we know that William Randolph Hearst was quite a character uh, and certainly had the money to do it. And then finally, this uh, airship or one of the airships uh, lost control and crashed into a town in Aurora, Texas and uh, essentially blew up and um, the pilot died. Anyway, this is a major, major thing. And uh, in today's books, it's basically promoted that, you know, again, these were aliens coming from trillions and trillions of miles away. And then, of course, their airship that gets, <clears throat> you know, 25 miles an hour crashes into a, a windmill and blows up. And uh, <laughs> that kind of shows to me one of the weaknesses of what you might call the UFO community. <laughs> but but uh, that's a separate topic. Anyway, so you might say, geez, what happened to this series of airships? Well, we don't know. Where'd they go? <laughs> Where's the documentation? We don't know. This uh, guy from the German secret society named Delschau became a bit famous as an artist uh, illustrator, and he illustrated a bunch of things that he uh, implied were part of the engine and design of that. And his artwork is incredibly expensive for um, a relatively unknown guy. So anyway, I think this story is like the first, um, what shall we say, thing we can chew on that shows that a military-industrial complex with black projects, rich people funding it, and essentially an independence from the government had occurred. I really don't think the president at the time had anything to do with it, any knowledge of it. And um, in the sense West Point was involved, it was mainly just um, if and when you get something useful, we want it but they didn't really control it. Uh, perhaps the investors had far more control. Um, and if you think this came out of nowhere, <clears throat> you might um, uh, consider that there was an amazing in inventor in the U.S. Um, named Solomon Andrews. You probably haven't heard of him. He's not well known today, although I think uh, the, the author John McPhee uh, did a book about him a little bit or some of his inventions. But he invented a, uh, a flying craft uh, in the 1860s. And he was from New Jersey. He'd had uh, maybe 25 successful inventions. He was a doctor. He was a mayor three times. He was an amazing character, and we certainly need more like that. But he offered it to Lincoln in the American War and um, demonstrated it at his own expense. It would go up and down and forwards and backwards no matter what the wind conditions were. And it's a little controversial today in terms of what he actually had accomplished. But uh, clearly he uh, exposed it to the world and wanted it to be used in the war. But as a practical matter, the war was over before this really came into being. Um, but you can already see by the turn of the century, by 1900, you can get a feeling that a military-industrial complex that's going, I guess you would say, black is uh, forming. And this is to say nothing of all the secret societies in Britain or Europe and, and their perspective on things. But I'm saying just sticking to the American context, we can already see by the year 1900 militarily important technology being essentially not under the control of the military, not under the control of the government, uh, kind of hidden behind uh, big money and secret societies. And uh, I think this is a very, very important uh, thing to consider because today many people talk about Tesla, but Tesla was not unique. That environment back then was all over. Um, so that's kind of the beginning that I would say in the modern era. Um, 
Oolong, I know you're familiar with uh, some of the past, what shall we say, the assassins and the secret societies and some of what they did. And clearly they had a lot of technology that was hidden too. Right. Because yep. they, right, they go together. Secret societies and high tech, to me, are like natural uh, kissing cousins. Well, what do they say too that you know um, if science to one group of people uh, would be considered magic to a more primitive group of people, right? Yeah, famous quote, um, and I think that's true. Uh, so, if you think that some of the early explorers were basically sent by royalty and secret societies, uh, you have to consider that they may have had relatively better technology than is known or is thought to have, exi thought to have existed at that time. Um, and I don't think it's any different now. Um, if we go to the moon or Mars or whatever, uh, I would not take it as a given that we're using or are limited to the technology that the average person on the street thinks we have. Well, I even, I've even read that uh, Christopher Columbus had access to maps that uh, the general public at the time didn't have access to that, that detailed North America. So he actually knew that it was there. I would consider that pretty likely. Um, I mean, the Peary race map is famous, and that's been widely dis distributed. But it's not just that. It's just the level that you're talking about. You're being funded by royalty. You're talking to a king or a queen right? Uh, that's at least at the level of an Apollo astronaut, right? I mean, so it, it shouldn't be surprising that this technology was amazing. Um, and so, anyway, the, uh, the airships kind of went away after this crash. And what happened to the technology, we don't know. But basically, we have so many sightings, I think you can make a strong case that it worked. Um, now, from there, it wasn't that long before we went into the age of Zeppelins, right? Uh, there was a famous uh, Zeppelin that went around the world with rich people, you know, spending, I forget, $10,000 for a seat or whatever it was, uh, which was a lot of money in the uh, 1920s or whenever, uh, late teen, you know, that, that time period. Um, and... A lot of people believe that the Hindenburg was uh, sabotaged um, because control of technology is so important. And I think that's entirely likely. And I also think that um, airships like that might be economical for all kinds of purposes. But we live under, basically, or we have lived under an oil dictatorship. Uh, Oil is the chosen means of controlling the masses. And um, uh, they don't want us to have any alternative to, you know, trucks or whatever. Uh, but you can see how, wait a minute, if we had this good technology in 1897, or at least promising technology, and then we had the, the age of the Zeppelins, and now we've got almost nothing, right? You've got a balloon race in New Mexico or something, right? Is that, is that the best we can do? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, all other technology is like light years better than it was 100 years ago. Yep. But the I balloons aren't. I know there's one company um, that I was uh, reading about on Bloomberg very recently, maybe like two weeks ago, that, that actually ha now has a fully working set of uh, lighter than airships uh, for uh, heavy transport. Um, and I, I did. I sort of noted it, and, and um, unfortunately, I, you get sort of lazy. I think with Google, I just said, "Oh yeah, I'll Google it when I, you know, if I ever need it again." It would be nice to know now. But um, so may, it'll be interesting to see if the if uh, if the company uh, runs into any unexpected problems as uh, as they actually become public and actually start taking cargo because they're about at that at that point. Uh, but it's interesting to note that they're, you know. According to what you're saying, they're using you know this this brand new technology that can carry you know uh, you know 100 tons or whatever um, is 100 years old. So, well, hopefully it's uh, got better uh, you know plastics and gadgets, and maybe people carry parachutes or whatever. But uh, it certainly is the case that um, technology goes underground 
and it doesn't necessarily go to the public. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's really painfully obvious. Um, uh, the airships were so amazing, and here it's not even talked about. And this inventor, Solomon Andrews, from uh, the mid-1800s, uh, some of his inventions were incredible, too. Um, he did get rich off of them, and he was a PR uh, master of sorts. Um, you know, he put a lot of money in a... One of his major inventions was uh, kind of a modern lock, and he put a lot of money in it and said, anybody who can, you know, get up here and, and pick this lock can have the money. And, uh, you know, nobody could successfully do it, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, it is a shame that we don't... Uh, spend more time thinking of these amazing inventions and inventors from the past because it would also immediately make us all think, wait a minute, if they had that 50 years ago or 100 years ago, whatever, then it's hard to believe that um, the scientists with good access to things don't have some amazing stuff today. A lot of it's been uh, suppressed. Uh, If you look at Tesla, you know, when he passed away, they they ran and scooped up all his patents and uh, kind of suppressed a lot of his, his technology. Yes, and um, we all have our stories if we've been around some technologies over the years. Uh, um, I'm, <laughs> I would just say I have heard from sources close to uh, um, what you would say high-level physicists that um, they have other materials. In other words, the, when you hear the official story for something like what a space shuttle tile is, that, that is actually not the case. Um, they say it's a ceramic, they say this, that, and the other, and I think there's a lot of evidence that that's not the case. And think about it, it's amazing. You can have something that's thousands of degrees, right, and you can put your hand on it, no problem. And um, anyway, I'm fairly familiar with that particular aspect of things, and I'm just saying there's a lot of evidence that uh, you should not believe what's written in the textbooks or Scientific American magazine. They're totally controlled by the, um, the breakaway civilization. So, to get back to the breakaway civilization, um, now we can see that they've developed technology, right, going into the turn of the century and then moving on. And then then we get into a more modern period with Tesla and Keeley. And um, Tesla, um, Herm, are you familiar with Tesla? Yes, very familiar with Tesla. I've actually built certain devices from, from Tesla, so, um, yeah. Um, well, cool. As a kid, I considered him like the, I don't know what you, the, the touchstone, I guess you might say. Oh, the, yeah. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the definition of the modern, enlightened man or whatever goal a uh, five-year-old has. Um, it's just something about his visage, you know. He just looked like with the bulb and, you know, in his hand and all that. He just, he just looked cool. What can I say? Yeah. <laughs> But it's more than that, of course. He was, uh, he was a man of amazing vision, and he had visions regularly, of course. Visions at, as in metaphysical things that, you know, mystical experiences mm-hmm. that came from wherever. And um, uh, I think that in the case of Tesla, there's been one of the greatest disinfo campaigns of all time. Or um, actually every kind of campaign. There's been a campaign to um, sully his character. There's been a campaign to ignore him, and then there's been a campaign to kind of mislead. Yeah, um, a lot of the, a lot of the smear campaign was uh, originated by Edison, I believe. Uh, a lot of it had to do with the alternating current versus the direct current. Yeah, and that's you, famous and pretty yeah. well known. Yeah, and I, Mark, I, you had some. Yeah, he uh, he had that. Uh, he he got uh, funding towards the end of his career from J.P. Morgan to mm-hmm. build that tower. I think it was in where New Jersey on the coast there. Was that and for was, free energy or yes, to draw? Well, yeah. well, technically it was to transmit energy, but uh, from reading a little bit about it, it sounds like it was actually uh, going to tap somehow uh, use use the Earth as a capacitor, the Earth, and the atmosphere as a dielectric, and it was going to tap into the ionosphere to create free energy, and. For no reason at all. I mean, for J.P. Morgan, I mean, for J.P. Morgan, this was like pocket change. Um, he was just about ready to get it going, and all of a sudden, the rug was pulled out from under him. He was, uh, well, I, I guess he was so 
he was so upset. I think it 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 it, it ended his life prematurely. You know, because uh, that was going to be his uh, his defining final and defining project of his career. Um, I think the remains of that tower are actually still there, at least the bottom. I think a lot of the metal has been taken away. So, yeah, that yes. that was, uh, that was quite a quite an episode, and uh, that was the f actually it's interesting you mentioned Tesla because that was the first time. You know, this was this was years ago where I, where I began to think, gee, you know, why would why would somebody you know why would this multi well for right now would be a multi billionaire fund this and then right at the point in time where you know Tesla was getting it into operation, the funding was pulled away, and, uh, and that's where we get to you know. Uh, what Plain is talking about about what's going on in the background, I'm sure. Right. You know, so. And so I'm going to argue that the breakaway civilization that I'm, the term being used here, uh, actually does that. They fund things, and when it gets promising, they cut it off or otherwise end it, and then it goes into mm. whatever the equivalent of an Area 51 is. <laughs> right. 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 And the point is. We don't even know the names of the people there. Uh, now, they may not be of the quality of Tesla, but if you give them good enough hints, they can handle it. Because they've got so much money, they can hire brains. And I wouldn't even rule out that, um, you know, did you ever see the movie Alternative 3? No. No, I haven't seen that one. Anyway, it's about the, it was a British spoof documentary um, uh, and in it, it speculates it, but it came across, you know, as being real. And so it caused a panic kind of like war of the worlds. Uh, it came across that a whole bunch of top British scientists have been dying suspiciously. And what's going on here? And anyway, the gist of it is, is there a joint U S and Soviet base on Mars? where they're faking the deaths of all kinds of scientists, right? And this is because the Earth is going to be destroyed or otherwise trashed hopelessly, so we need to have a new civilization, you know, in the future. Um, uh, it wouldn't be unreasonable to think a lot of dead scientists didn't actually die. They just kind of um, moved to another location, so to speak. But we can never know. A lot of them are indeed killed. Um, anyway, so Herm, that, that Tesla thing gives you an idea that, wait a minute, they, why are they funding this in the first place, and then why are they killing it at the time they do? And whatever you can say, those billionaires had some, I guess what you'd say, clear vision of how they wanted to dominate things. And um, it's hard to believe they just did it for no reason. Uh, anyway, moving on with Tesla, I think you, you get, well, first, let me just say my speculation is I think it was to uh, draw electricity out of the uh, the background so to speak you could call it the ether if you will but um, I'm a believer in the electric universe theory as a general hypothesis and I think there are currents of electricity all over and this explains lightning and uh, you know cyclones and all mm -hmm. kinds of things um, and in selective cases that energy is practically unlimited and indeed we could use it to send uh, small ships in space or whatever, just the way ships came across the oceans and back uh, based on wind and ocean currents, because I think they're the equivalent of uh, electrical currents. Um, but again, it just went against the paradigm. They want a controlled grid. We had a discussion of this in our uh, last time about grids, the whole idea of a grid, um, and I call them slave grids. They want grids that they control. And um, have you noticed in the U.S. how few gasoline stations there are today? Um, you know, when I was a kid, they were all over the place. And I visited the U.S., and there really aren't that many anymore. And there are only a few companies, too. Uh, in my neck of the woods, they actually were going to do uh, a major refinery expansion uh, and actually build a, a secondary oil refinery. Uh, mm -hmm. It was to be partnered with BP. And then at the last minute, they just pulled the plug and canceled the whole project. They had the land bought, and they had, you know, uh, implemented. They'd gone quite a, quite a ways down this path. And then for whatever reason, it just got axed at the last minute. And I have my theories as to why that is as well. Well, I think um, if we're talking about the oil industry, we should um, probably consider quotes from 
the oil industry's most famous philosopher, John Rockefeller. <laughs> and um, capital uh, c- competition is a sin, is one of them, right? <laughs> yeah. So what you're describing would have been competition, and that's just immoral, or at least if you're in charge of things. <laughs> so um, anyway, but the capitalists are a key part of the whole thing, and I don't mean to attack capitalism. I'm just saying rich and powerful people uh, – abuse that. And I think that the quote I gave at the beginning about the power elite having a kind of organized irresponsibility. They don't have an ideology, in my opinion. Their ideology is power. And um, so they regularly fund groups that pretend to be against them, like environmentalists or whatever, you know, human rights activists or something. Um, But indeed, it's all about power. Okay, so moving on to a couple of other uh, inventors from back in the, those days. There was a guy named Keeley, John Keeley, who was um, uh, successful with things like a vape, what was it, a vaporic, vaporific engine. Anyway, a motor. He um, uh, demonstrated essentially vaporizing, you know, small mounds or little hills and then gathering the good things in them that you needed, like uh, whatever, gold or minerals or something like that. Um, he was another successful inventor in the uh, the stable that came out of the U.S. at that time. And um, he was funded very well, and then it kind of went away. And one wonders if that, too, didn't go black. I think the odds are very, very high that it did. Um, but he was quite an inventor, and it's worth reading about him. Um, as far as other inventors of that time, there are just so many. It was an age of invention. Um, if we just had a list of all the inventions from, let's say, 1900 to 1940, uh, I, I think we'd all sit here in amazement that, well, why can't we have that? Why can't we have that? Why can't we have that? Um, I've just been reading about, um, uh, lately, absorption uh, refrigeration. Are you familiar with that? Never heard of it. Never heard of it. Herm, you might be. No, uh, no actually, I'm not. Mm-mm. Okay, well, we don't need to go into it much, but, I mean, it's used for, uh, like, um, recreational vehicles, RVs traveling around, Um, these kind of uh, camper van things that go around. But it's you take heat and turn it into cold. Um, Oh, is this a Pelcher effect, Um, uh, heat and cold generator? Well, there's the, 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 these metallic plates. I forgot what metals they're made from. But if you, put a, if you put a voltage across it, one side gets hot, one side gets cold? No, this, is oh, just, okay. Um, okay. this has been around forever. But like in um, the case of uh, remote v, uh, RVs, they would be, let's say, propane. They would use propane gas. But uh, before the grid in the United States and others, there were companies that made these kinds of refrigerators. And you could use, let's say, kerosene to generate the cold. And um, uh, there was oh, a like ammonia. Comp- like uh, well, like the old, old style one. Okay, oh, I, didn't, I didn't know what the uh, proper term was uh, in English, but yeah, I, I'm familiar with that technology. Yeah. It's very efficient. Extreme yes. Efficient. And it makes you wonder when you go in summer to a place like Phoenix or Las Vegas and you say, you know, they're spending all this money on keeping everything cool, but they have endless heat all around. You wonder, can't this be used better, right? <laughs> and you also, right, you also right. wonder when you go to a place like uh, Canada in the winter, right, can't they use all this cold a little better? <laughs> but that's another <laughs> question, right? Right, right. Um, but anyway, um, so what was the name? There was a, co- a, a famous company that had all kinds of great devices and, uh, you know, engines. Uh, they had cars. They had great stuff. What were they called? The Crosley Brothers, I think, or the Costly Brothers. And um, you can find these things in antique shows or shops now and then and some of their other neat inventions. And uh, they made a lot of money selling stuff to poorer countries like India. Uh, but um, they also sold to rural Americans or Canadians or what have you. Um, and um, General, well, anyway, you know the same story. General Motors, General Electric, all these generals, right? The worst generals of all, as the quote goes. Um, all these generals came in and wanted to create a grid, and they bought these things up to get rid of them. They did everything they could to cut off the oxygen supply of alternative technologies. Um, but I just happened to be looking into this lately and, and thinking about playing around with it a bit. 
And um, it's just another example of some interesting technology from, in this case, let's say the 20s, that um, you basically can't get easily. You're, you're going to have to, I mean, I, they're testing it in top-level universities, but they make it sound like it's this difficult, amazing thing. It's not. It was a very widely used technology um, 80, 90, 100 years ago. It's, um, I, I guess it's not even, sorry to interrupt, but it's not even the uh, techno, you know, so-called uh, sort of hidden or technology, but I, I remember that in the, in the 20s, uh, in the history of New England, they loved railroads and trolleys and things like that. Um, General Motors, Goodyear, and Standard Oil uh, made a consortium up, and they literally bought up every single trolley line in New England and tore them up. Um, I remember people telling me I lived lived in Connecticut for a while, you could get from the smallest little town in Conne Litchfield, Connecticut, to New York City in about three hours, you know, <laughs> all by trolley and then by track. And, uh, you know, this went on for about 10 years, and it was basically dismantling an infrastructure uh, that nowadays would, would have, you know, would have taken care of gridlock, at least, for example, southern Connecticut. It was, uh, it was actually one of the most amazing stories I'd heard you know, up to that time, um, that that this just went on for ten years. They literally just bought it up one after the other, wrecked them, and then put in the buses and you know whatever, which you know don't don't particularly work well. But anyway, so just uh, going along with what you were saying there, plain. Well, we get back to the problem of these ultra rich and what they're up to. Um, you know, they don't want us to have a good civilization. They want themselves to have a good civilization. There's a new movie coming out called Elysium, uh, which uh, is essentially about, in the future, uh, let's say in, in orbit, whatever, an L5 point or something like that, you have these massive um, colonies that are a paradise on Earth, so to speak, for the rich. And then down on the earth, what have you got? You've got robot policemen and uh, you know road warriors scrounging, scrounging for everything, right? Scrounging for everything. <laughs> um, pretty pathetic scene, right? But um, I'm arguing that's what they really would like to have. That's part of the idea of a breakaway civilization, is they don't really consider themselves part of us. Um, let's take um, a more modern, simple to understand example would be the mafia. Right, you may have met or known or had friends or whatever. I've had friends who are kids of mafia families, and um, you know it's it's just their own little world. They are separate from everybody else. They have their own rules. They have you know it's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, now they'll come and you know buy and sell with you. But in a major way, there's a certain element of um, standoffishness, I guess you might say, right? Uh, and they have their own ways of handling disputes, too. It's not all just, you know, gunning somebody down. Now, <clears throat> to me, the mafia is a very limited idea. It's a low-level kind of thing. Um, I think that when we're talking about a breakaway civilization, a better example would be the SS in Germany. Nazis as the Nazi SS. It was a state within a state. They had everything as though they were separate from the country that they were ruling. So, in other words, in a, in the United States, you have a governor, the governor of whatever New Mexico, right? Well, in the case of the Nazis, they would have a governor, and that's kind of like the official thing that the masses get to think about. But they would have an SS governor for New Mexico. And from their point of view, he was the true governor. Right? Mm -hmm. The plebeians, the hoi polloi, can think that they have a government if they want to. But the true government is the SS. In other words, there's a, there's a government above it as far as they were concerned. There's a civilization above it as far as they were concerned. And over time, they were very, very seriously trying to create their own R&D, military R&D, and, and um, a very high priority was finance. They never wanted to be dependent on the government. They could plunder the government, you understand, but they never, ever wanted to feel inconvenienced by the government. <laughs> okay. 
right? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just saying, isn't that what we have today? Right? Just the SS on steroids is more the modern form. Um, <laughs> so they did a lot of things. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's take uh, the financial angle. Uh, in the last, what, seven years, I think there have been five or six major interesting financial bearer bonds and other huge counterfeiting type operations that have been busted. Uh, Italy on the border with uh, Switzerland, Spain. Um, anyway, there are, some of these are not available in English newspapers. You have to read another language like Spanish to, uh, to read about them. Um, but we're talking here hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars worth of bonds floating around. And, well... <clears throat> many of these, well, almost all of them, actually, they have original, like, lockboxes from the Federal Reserve in 1930s. They have, you know, they have supporting evidence that's overwhelming with some of these. But then they also have minor flaws that you would never make if you were good. So what are we to make of this? Well, first of all, the stories are immediately hushed up. But... I think there are factional wars going on. I think that uh, the different groups that are fighting uh, threaten to undermine the financial bases of other groups. And um, to give you an example of this, in World War II, the SS got the idea to counterfeit British currency. I was just going to bring that up plain. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it's called Operation Bernhardt. Unterum nun... Bernhard, I guess, in my poor German. Um, and uh, by the end of the war, are you ready for this? By the end of the war, 40, 50 percent of British currency was made by the Nazis, <laughs> okay, in the world. But it was perfect. Those were the demands. The, the um, you know, Hitler and the, the people were authorizing it said, you're not to counterfeit. You are to make unauthorized productions, which is what they did. <laughs> In other words, basically, okay. what can I say? I'm a fan of German um, perfectionism, I guess you would say, right? Dure preciseness, I guess, yes. maybe. Um, so they, uh, you know, they precisely followed orders and they precisely created perfect banknotes. So after the war, Britain was forced to essentially get rid of all of its currency, right? Because like 50% of it or whatever is, is Nazi and they knew that they'd gone underground and were going to make more, right? So, <laughs> so, <we're> so <laughs> now, <clears throat> uh, the point, though, is this wasn't the Germans doing it. I mean, it was economic warfare at the time, but, I mean, it was the SS doing it. And I think they did it after the war, and they're doing it today. The Bormann Organization and all of our wonderful friends in those kinds of groups. Um, now, don't get me wrong. Undoubtedly, let's take, for example, the famous case of... Um, $100 bills, and they say, oh my, the North Koreans are, uh, you know, counterfeiting them. Well, if they're counterfeiting them, it's because somebody gave them the plates, right? <laughs> gave them the paper and gave them the plates, you know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. It's, it's, it's one of those three-letter groups or some other three-letter group from another country, you know, like the, uh, the KGB or something like that. Um, anyway, uh, this is a perfect example, though, of uh, something that was done as a breakaway thing. Okay, there was no way a member of parliament in Germany at that time could have found out about this, right? Now you can say, well, it's wartime and all that. That's true. That is true. But I think the issue is that the people in these groups, like the SS, had this attitude that they were not part of the broader civilization. They were a breakaway civilization. They were above the regular civilization. And they wanted their own technology, they wanted their own finance, they wanted their own army, they wanted their own courts, or at least, you know, methods of resolving disputes, that kind of thing. And I think they achieved it, and I think the world we're living in today, it's becoming more and more obvious that they've achieved it. And um, this is a long discussion, but if you just consider for a second, a small outfit by the SS managed to create for the sake of the argument, 40-50% of all British banknotes in the world. I mean, that's, that's an amazing accomplishment. Yes, it, wasn't an, it was not an official German government thing, right? 
this was just a, a you know some small group in the SS did this. So, Plain, are you implying that at that time, the many people in the German government didn't know about this, even though it was it was obviously uh, uh, good for the war effort? But are, are you implying that basically uh, the SS was using this money, but not exactly coming back with a uh, a bill of sale about what you know what they'd used it for? Oh, I think it was compartmentalized. I don't think people okay, in the that's... SS. I don't think people in the SS knew about it. Oh, okay. Kind kind of I like mean, certain well, three mean... letter. I was just going to say kind of like certain three letter agencies running heroin and whatnot. Oh yeah. yes, right, right. Yeah, I mean this is classified. There's a need to know basis. I mean, a lot of the modern American national security state is just copied from the way the Nazis did it, because they did it so much better. Um, and. For better or for worse, we're now living in the uh, results of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. But but here's an example, though. They had it all worked out how to use the money because, you know, how do you get the paper, right? But how do you distribute it, particularly in wartime? You're enemies, right? Well, one of the ways they distributed it, you're going to like this, is they used it to buy stuff from their enemies. Let's say in Yugoslavia, they're fighting um, Yugoslav partisans, right, the enemies of uh, the Nazis. And through third parties or whatever, they would just buy guns from them with all this paper. So they found ways to use it, which I think is also impressive. Um, because you're such obvious enemies as Britain and Germany in World War II. To find a way to use the money seems amazing to me. Say, so maybe they, that, that's the money they used to pay the Bofors cannons from Sweden, right? <laughs> uh, I'm bringing okay, it up because Sw Sweden used to sell Bofors cannons to anybody, uh, uh, you know, England, America, whatever. But uh, but I, I guess uh, I guess that would make sense. Yeah. So anyway, hmm. uh, this was an amazing accomplishment by a small group in the SS, and I'm just saying, think about that. Think about what they could and did do after World War II, and think of how other groups like three-letter agencies in the U.S would view that, right? They would say, we got to do that. We got to get in on this racket. And after all, it's national security, right? We must do it. It's God's will. <laughs> so, right? Who wants God's oversight? <laughs> so there you go. And I think this, these recent oh, four, five, six cases with, you know, trillion dollars of bonds that have been... Uh, um, what shall we say, exposed, you know, people arrested, that kind of thing. Um, I think there's a very good case that these are intentional cases to, uh, what shall we say, undermine the people who hold the real ones. And so this is controversial, but I'm thereby arguing that there is a level of finance above the one we know. Um, and I think that level of finance includes uh, gold, I think it includes these bearer bonds. Um, and looking into it is a tricky thing. But we do know a lot of things. We know that in World War II, Japan had an official policy called Operation Lily and, uh, of, of stealing everything they could, <laughs> essentially, and shooting people if they didn't give them everything. And we now tend to call it Yamashita's Gold. It was run by the... Um, the emperor of Japan's brother, and they just sucked up like a vacuum cleaner all the valuable stuff in China, Philippines, wherever. And um, they also, of course, ran opium markets and other things. Uh, I guess you would say it's at least a trillion dollars in today's terms. Um, a lot of it they couldn't get back to Japan once they were once they lost ocean safety. And a lot of it got stuck in the Philippines. And a lot of the politics in the world and in Asia in the last, well, since World War II, has been based on this massive amount of resources over there that the Japanese stole. And let's say half of it got left in the Philippines or something. Hmm. Um, because that led to the national security state of the U.S. having tremendous resources that did not require any action by the Congress. Now, it sort of made it easier to launder the, uh, yeah, I mean, they're essentially pre-laundered in a sense. Yes, and, but here's the problem. The massive amounts of gold 
would destroy the U.S. dollar because the dollar was based on gold. Um, so they couldn't release it. They had to. They were doing almost all of their deals at high levels off the books, essentially. And this has continued, I think. And then some of the th resources, I mean, if you read the history, it's quite interesting. It's like the U.S. is funding the commies in China. And as they take over an area, they plunder everything. So, um, the CIA sends the planes on the path of the commies and says, well, if you give us all your gold, we'll fly it out and we'll give you a piece of paper that's got some signature from, uh, you know, Morgenthau or whoever, somebody in the U.S. government, to eventually make whole, right? Now, isn't this, some, this, now we get back to disaster capitalism or whatever you want to call it, wartime profiteering, right? You fund the guys to rape and plunder, and then you offer a jet <laughs> to take their valuables and tell them one day you'll give them back most of it. That's an amazing racket. Um, and, of course, this was done by uh, Chenault's team, you know, what became uh, Air America and that whole complex, Evergreen, mm -hmm. whatever, right? Um, but the point is, this is not something that the U.S. Congress or some bureaucrat really had anything to do with. So you can see that also is part of this breakaway civilization. The technology and the money and then the actions in wartime kind of became, I guess you would say, privatized, if you want to use that word. But I think that's kind of limited. I think it's bigger than that. I think it's that it sort of went black. Um, so anyway, we can see successful cases of the idea of a state within a state with the SS, right? They were just amazing. And I think they've been copied. For example, their R&D program. Uh, the famous Hans Kammler, I don't know if you've looked into Nazi weapons research, which was decades ahead of what was in the U.S. at the time. Um, there's a, a, a tremendous book by a guy named Igor Witkowski from Poland called something like The Wonder Weapons of the, the Luftwaffe. But the point is, they had stuff in prototype form in, let's say, 1944 or 45 that is just amazing to look at. Uh, they had stuff flying that... <laughs> anyway, I want it. I want some... I want to build it. <laughs> it's that good. It's impressive. And you sit there and say, wait a minute, this is like 70 years later. Um, so that gives you an idea of what they had achieved. But their best achievements were done under the SS, not under the normal... You know. And Hans Kammler was the guy behind it. Hmm. And there's only like one photo of him. Oh, by the way, he vanished at the end of the war. He just totally vanished. Like so many of the people that are interesting in Nazi Germany, they just all vanished. Plain, uh, we uh, Wong, uh, Fox, Five and I were just talking a little bit earlier, um, and hopefully this isn't too much of a digression, but um, that, that uh, it seems like a lot, of, uh, a lot of the SS folks did get a, a sort of a free pass for having cooperated against the uh, evil communists in, in you know, post World War II, and uh, I know that I was I had mentioned that there's this town in South America, Chile, that um, is basically uh, populated by SS, you know, second and third generation. And uh, Uwang, I guess you knew the name of the town. I mean, you knew what yeah. the place was. I just got it from a friend of mine who'd been hiking around Chile 20 years ago. Um, I, what, what is the name of that town? Um, Col Colonia Dignidad. Um, now it's named uh, something Bavaria. I can't recall the new name. So, yeah, so I, I, I guess a lot of, uh, Plain, you think a lot of the people moved there? Uh, and are, well, clearly they moved there, but, you know, what are they doing now? <laughs> um, hmm. Well, um, I think if we're going to discuss, like, the SS, you, you asked, uh, Herm, I think it was you, you asked along the lines of, right, um, or you said something along the lines of, well, we needed their help, and so we, we you know, had to forgive them or whatever, they're fighting the commies. But, you know, we, um, we forgave them during World War II, you know, we didn't bomb IG Farben, because it had merged, essentially, in a share swap with Standard Oil. So, it's like the most important c company in Nazi Germany, we were under orders to not attack. 
Right. Uh, right. Well, because... also, but also Standard so... Oil was the one who gave them uh, tetraethyl lead just prior to the war. Um, sure. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And so you see. Yeah. <laughs> so. But you're asking, like, did we forgive them or something? Okay. It's more like a, a you know, sibling <laughs> rivalry or something. We had a little spat, but we're still okay. brothers, right? Oh, so okay. let's get back in the fold. We're both, you know. <laughs> so, right. Sorry about that. But that's yeah, the truth of I the matter. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying, yeah. yeah. So, you know, we had this little fight over who's going to get what cut and who who's going to, which banking system we're going to use. But now that that spat's over, we're still brothers, let's go back to doing what we've always done, which is plunder the world or whatever. <laughs> You know, sorry to be a little um, jaded in my view there, but oh no, uh, I mean I think the Kerry Commission stuff that you know went on with uh, Ford, Ford getting a Medal of Honor uh, from from Mr. Schuckelgruber because of the, uh, you know they they owned Opel, and uh, yeah sure, and uh, they made all the motors for the trucks. Um, and they also right. made the JU87 engines and, you know, et cetera. And I think the Kerry Commission report came, came because Ford and Standard Oil, because they did have some of their operations bombed, they actually went to Congress. This, th- this truly is astounding. I have the, the, the actual congressional record document because I just found it amazing uh, that, that um, they were asking for war reparations. Yeah, well. They were, they were asking Congress for war reparations for their factories that had gotten bombed in Germany. I thought that was, you know, (laughs) I thought that was... It gives a new, um, is the phrase chutzpah? Yes, yes, exactly. Chutzpah, right, right. Is is what comes to mind. But, um, okay, well, so you asked about, like, Latin American Nazi elements or something. Well, let's discuss Argentina if we want to discuss the breakaway civilization. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Because that's where some of it came into being that we know of. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it's a long topic. Um, uh, There are a couple of good books that are like uh, in Spanish only uh, called something like A Nazi Tourist Guide to um, Bariloche. And Bariloche uh, is near... Uh, Chile in uh, the mountains of uh, Argentina, and it basically looks like Bavaria. And um, a lot of top Nazis went there, and there are photos. There's a photo from there that I think looks exactly like Hitler would have, you know, 20 or whatever, 15 years later. But um, clearly a lot of these characters went there and had their organizations there. And um, uh, Juan Perón, the... uh, the dictator of uh, Argentina was a fanatical Nazi. I mean, he went to German military academy. He uh, he loved all things German and all things fascist. So um, they had a welcome home, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are two things I would add to this. One is um, they did uh, nuclear and anti gravity research, uh, other things down there after the war. Uh, one of their better physicists named Kurt Richter uh, was down there, and it kind of became a public topic. Uh, he was continuing some of the stuff that he'd been doing during the war, and uh, then it had to be dismantled, and um, it went somewhere else. But still, the remains of some of the labs and all down there can be found if you uh, are interested. Um, and then a big story, I think, that puts this whole breakaway civilization idea in is that a minute ago, I said that the, the Japanese stole whatever, a trillion dollars in modern terms, let's say, right? And again, the, the government of Japan didn't get it, you understand, right? Mm-hmm. It's the people around the secret police and the imperial family and, you know, guys like that, right? And the Yakuza, the modern Yakuza, are kind of a creation from that. They are the enforcers to um, steal from people. Um, <clears throat> well, the Nazis also stole a lot of stuff. Right? We know that. Um, not just simply Jews. I mean, anybody in Eastern Europe, I mean, they stole everything they could. It was part of the war. Um, but after the war, uh, more and more reports came in over the years that a lot of top Nazis went to uh, Argentina. Right? Now, we'd had, rep- I mean, Stalin said he never believed for a minute that Hitler was killed. No way. He said he went to Spain and then left to South America or something. And um, that was poo-pooed in the uh, you know, Western press, right? Uh, you know, all good Nazis died, right? All the top Nazis died. They committed suicide or 
you know, whatever, jumped right. in a volcano or something, right? And here's the teeth to prove it and all that stuff. Right? And here are the teeth, and then later we find out they're from 12-year-old girls and stuff like that. So, <laughs> right? Details, details, right. Minor right. details. They didn't know about, you know, DNA testing, and, you know, yeah. it took a while. But now, now we can see that. So anyway, but uh, a famous journalist from that time, he covered the uh, surrender of Japan, uh, a guy named Paul Manning. He was one of the top. Uh, radio personalities and and later you know TV guys in America um, got so many reports that the Nazis had gone to Argentina that he kind of started looking into it and uh, he published a book called Martin Bormann Nazi in Exile now Bormann was number two in the Nazi party and after Hitler supposedly died he was number one and people routinely routinely refer to the Bormann organization as the uh, the underground Nazi movement which, in my opinion, is not very underground. <laughs> it's more like in space and in the sky and all around us. But that's another matter. Um, anyway, uh, so we got this guy, Bormann. Well, this journalist, Manning, looks into it, and he comes up with all kinds of information, photos, bank accounts. Okay, in his book, he's got a, a picture of a bank account. He got one. It was a joint bank account between Martin Bormann and Juan Perón, and it was in Chase Bank in New York, and it was a hundred million bucks. <laughs> what? What year was right? this? Ah, the late forties. <laughs> oh, man. Right. Okay. You know, whatever, fifty-one or something, nineteen fifty. Yeah. You know that that kind of period. So it was small change, right? Um, but you know, a hundred million bucks, and that was you know I'm you know kind of just personal you know you know Petty take catch. from it. If, yeah, if you need to take from it, kind of thing, you know, right? But it was at Chase in New York, right? Yeah. Well, we all so we all know we all know that Prescott Bush was accused of collaborating with the Nazis, right? And uh, he was also a member of Skull and Bones, which originally traced its heritage back to Germany as well. Interestingly enough, isn't that interesting? Well, Germany is a long topic, isn't it? Though their secret societies look a lot nastier than uh, you know the ones I see in the U.S. But anyway. Um, you know, like Scorzani with his uh, face slashed, you know, one of the nastier secret societies in Germany. You've got a slash fencing, face like that. Fencing clubs, yeah. right? Um, yeah, it's a, it, sure, but it's a special thing they use for that. It's not just a, I, I don't think it's just a normal, well, I'm not knowledgeable enough, but I've read it in the past, but just don't remember it. But anyway, um, moving on. So this guy, Paul Manning, writes this book, and he's got all this great stuff, photos of, Nazis, testimony, you name it, all kinds of stuff. And actually, he um, got the chance to talk to different people. Um, this might sound amazing, but um, basically, a lot of the Nazis, and I mean top Nazis here, after the war, were, let's say by the 1960s, were incredibly proud of what they had done. They thought they'd pulled off one of the great tricks in world history. They had um, successfully gone underground, hidden all their money, developed their technology, you know, consolidated their political power, and essentially now they were uh, becoming a force in the world again. And it was only a matter of time till they took over Europe or at least the EU or whatever. That was by, let's say, the 70s. Um, and um, a number of them actually thought it was fine. They thought they could go public. You know, the war's over. It was just, a, again, a, a, you know, a sibling rivalry. What's the big deal? Um, but the sons, the children of the Nazis, said, no way, you got to be kidding me. If we go public, it would be, like, dangerous, devastating, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the children carried the day. And so they stayed underground for, you know, a while. Um, but uh, anyway, the journalist, when he had his book published, it's like the day the book was published, the publisher was thrown out of a window and had his legs broken. And a few days later, the author's son was murdered in his apartment for no reason, and they didn't steal any money lying around. Um, so you get an idea of uh, the price one pays for looking into certain topics. But the evidence is overwhelming. Um, a lot of top Nazis went to Argentina. Um, but they also went to New Mexico or, you know, right, right Patterson Air Force Base. So, yeah, I was going to say, yeah, this, the space program, right. 
Um, um, yeah, I'm personally familiar with the space program <laughs> a fair bit. And I would say, um, yeah, they, uh, um, I mean, come on, they, they ran it for the U.S. and they largely <laughs> ran the Soviet one, which raises all kinds of questions because we're supposedly competing and it's like, wait a minute, I'm not sure we're competing in the normal sense here. But anyway, um, so we have this underground Nazi movement that had at least hundreds of billions of dollars to play with, and I would argue the best technology on the planet at the time, too. Um, now, they didn't have the industrial-scale factories that the U.S. had, like Michigan, right? Um, so, when you later see things, like in the, 19, in the Eisenhower administration, you know, um, UFOs went over the White House and, you know, kind of parked there for an hour or something. Um, it was on the front page of the D.C. paper, or one of the D.C. papers. The other one didn't cover it. Um, uh, I'm going to go back to that thing about the airships in 1897. I'm not sure that, you know, these visitors from trillions of miles away come here with, you know, cigar balloons and crash into windmills and, and blow up. I'm saying that those ships that were over the White House looked awfully like some of the ones the Nazis were developing at the end of World War II and that you can see photos of. It's declassified. They had them. And uh, with the fall of East Germany, they also declassified a lot more. So it's kind of like Here's something that they had as a prototype in 1945, and then in whatever, you know, 1954 or whatever it was, you have these things flying over the, uh, the White House. Um, I would say that it might have been the breakaway civilization that I'm referring to involved there. So what would that be, just an intimidation tactic? Uh, in that case, yeah, I would say it would be a factional thing. I would think that the, uh, the German faction would be saying that, um, you know, you got to let us sit at the table, right? Yeah. I mean, if you don't, we'll blow things up, <laughs> like New York City. <laughs> Make them an offer you know, they can't minor, refuse. Minor things like New York City, right? Now, that's just my guess. I mean, I can't prove that, but I'm just saying that... Even if they just had technology that wasn't very controllable, but if it was nasty enough, it could be used as leverage in their factional struggles. And right around the time of that, you know, not long afterwards came the Bilderberg meeting. And many argue the Bilderberg meeting is like a coming together of the American-British side with the German-Central European side. Um, I don't know. But it certainly has that feeling if you look at the guest lists and the topics and so on. And just being put together by Prince Bernhardt of uh, Holland, who was an SS officer. Isn't that interesting? We come back to that idea of an SS officer, right? And he was, uh, you know, the, uh, what can we say, the, the highest guy in uh, Holland, right? So here Holland is fighting the Germans, and yet... <laughs> The highest guy in the royal family is a, is an SS officer, isn't this? Uh, so it raises all these questions. I mean, what is this civilization? Who are these people we're fighting? But anyway, um, that SS mindset kind of took over, and I think you see it in the U.S. today with the, the compartmentalization, the idea that you have duplicate or triplicate projects as cover stories for things. I don't know if you've had this experience, Herm, but... If if you work on a story, if you work on a, t a technology and it's actually a cover story, it 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 it's kind of disappointing when you realize that what you're working on, it didn't matter if it succeeded. It was just to be the thing that they say they're doing, right? Right, right. And, the cover. And I, and I think we've seen that so much now. I'm familiar with it in the military, but I let's just take um, uh, uh, NASA. NASA is kind of going away now, right? I mean, they're not doing anything. And you have to say, well, that can't be, can it? The importance of, of all that we're working on, right? So, I mean, come on, the, the Army has white paper saying, whoever controls space controls Earth, right? Right, I was going to say that, uh, I mean, if I, you know, if I was dictator, you know, taking control of space is, would be the number one thing starting, you know, from 1956. I mean, it would, right. or whatever. I mean, without that, you're pretty much toast. 
But yeah, go ahead. Yes. So anyway, I'm just saying that they, in my opinion, they they do this now. They have two or three projects, and one is the cover story for something. And this applies to all kinds of R&D, not just, let's say, some super miniaturized nuclear bomb or something like that, right? I'm talking about even something as mundane as their um, ESP spying, the remote viewing program, right? They had the official place that the journalist could have was in a beat up, condemned building in Fort Meade that everybody could see, right? <laughs> a lot of people in D.C. knew about it, and eventually Jack Anderson, the famous, uh, you know, journalist who investigated things and whatever, got his teeth into it. Now, if you spend any time around R&D or military R&D, I mean, even just corporate R&D, now wait a minute. Something as controversial as that, that you're trying to hide and it's classified, are you going to put it in, like, one of the two condemned buildings from, that were leftovers from World War II at Fort Meade? Or are you going to place, put it in a place that nobody can find in New Mexico? Right? It makes no sense to have it in a place that... Fort Meade is a huge, huge place. And it's right near D.C. Huge, huge number of people yep. can see it. You wouldn't put something there unless you wanted it to be seen. Because that's the cover for the actual program. Right, right. and, and saying, journalists are so lazy that you really have to put it in their face so they can see it. But yeah, go, right, I understand. Um, so I'm saying that this breakaway civilization, not only have they got stuff in space, they've got other things like financier specialists, you know, counterfeiting specialists. They've got, you know, they've got uh, better physics books <laughs> by far <laughs> than you've got at Princeton, you know what I mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. Much better. Um because, you see, they have access to the good stuff. I mean, uh, you know, there was the head of um, uh, Lockheed Skunk Works, Ben Rich. He's famous. As he, uh, like the year or so before he was dying, he had cancer. He gave a bunch of speeches all over where he said, look, we have the technology to take E.T. home. Okay. But it would take an act of God to get it out of the black projects. Right? And... He said that many times in different places. And he just said, look, I got cancer, I'm dying soon. What are they going to do to me? Right? He didn't give you the specifics. But he did say something very interesting. He said there was an error in the equations. We eventually discovered there was an error, the physics, in standard physics. And that's, that's what led to all the progress we made. But then he didn't say what that error was. But um, I think the skunk works is part of that breakaway civilization. So anyway, that's kind of where we're coming from. We're, we're developing this group that now has the money, the independence, and of course the, the muscle, so to speak, you know, the, the, the hit men and whatever it is you need, right, to protect something. Uh, so that there they are. And they can have the luxury of creating two or three programs when they want to do something. Which is an amazing luxury. I mean, if you really were like, Push, pressed for money and whatever in wartime, you just do one. But nope, they got the ability to do three. And one of them is the one that they don't mind if the journalists find, um, at least in my opinion. So that's kind of how it developed, and then that's where we're going, is this uh, kind of secret society. Um, uh, Oolong, I got a question for you. Have you ever heard of uh, Lord Blackheath? Sounds familiar, but off the back of my hand, I, I, don't re I don't recall. So a few years ago in the House of Lords, he gave two or three speeches talking about how um, he'd been approached by somebody with trillions of pounds. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I did hear about this. Yes. Uh, what did he call it? Something Foundation X or something like Foundation that? Foundation X. And the story was they, you know, they do some good things, they do some bad things, but, you know, they figured it'd be reasonable to spend a certain amount, you know, a few billion here and there, you know, just to show they're serious, right? Yeah. Um, and this Lord Blackheath had handled uh, various big money deals involving things like the IRA and uh, terror stuff operations in North Africa and such, right? And everybody kind of ran away from it. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Um, but if you read his entire, you know, everything he had to say about it, 
it's quite interesting. He's saying, look, this is so well done that this is either a factional scam, right, to cause all kinds of mischief, is the word he used, or this is real and that there's a level above the official level of finance that we're told. But it's above his pay grade to, to know what to do with it. As it is, it's already risky, so he's not going to do any more. Yeah, when I uh, first heard it, I thought it was a, I thought it was a scam. But um, <clears throat> in, in hindsight of the breakaway civilization concept, maybe it wasn't. Right, and then the breakaway civilization concept also gets into the eternal question, right? A lot of people say, uh, why do these rich oligarchs, whoever, the DuPonts or Rockefellers or Rothschilds, why don't they care about the health of the planet? What about their grandchildren? Right? Yeah. Well, and then there are all kinds of theories, right? It's, uh, you, na you name your theory. Well, they're reptiles or whatever, right? Um, it's, it's, they're demonically possessed or whatever. There are all kinds of theories. And I don't actually mean to, to, to really put down any particular theory. I, I'm not saying I have an answer on this. But it certainly begs that question, right? They got to live on this planet. Do they really want chemtrails in the air? Yeah, that's uh, the, the million dollar question for sure. And, and, and again, maybe a trillion dollar it. question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but if you have this idea of a breakaway civilization and they just figure that, well, we've been lying, you know, Mars is totally fit for human life and we can build these uh, stations like Babylon 5 or. Or, you know, like at the L5 points or whatever, this, this movie Elysium about, you know, super paradise in orbit while the Earth goes to hell. And then after the people work things out and go back to, uh, you know, living like animals, uh, you know, maybe eventually they'll return down here once we're all gone or whatever. But they can, you know, come here for sport, right? Like the Roman Colosseum or something, right? Um, I don't know, but it's a possibility that... Once you get to the point of the technology they have, their concerns are different. Their concerns are life extension. Their concerns are building the Terminator society, you know, that kind of thing, right? Um, so they don't really consider themselves part of our civilization. I mean, for the last 100, 200 years ago, they haven't considered nations to matter, right? I mean, David Rockefeller in his book essentially says... It's, it's phrased cleverly, but he basically says, some people say I'm a traitor to my country, but if that's the charge, I'm proud of it. You know, I want to build a new world order, <laughs> right? Um, so he's already said, I mean, these guys have said for the last hundred years, uh, who is that famous, um, uh, one of the Warburgs essentially said, we're going to have a global government. The only question is if it will be by conquest or consent. Right? Wasn't that Quigley that said that? Carol no, Quigley? It wasn't Quigley. No, it was one of the Warburgs, one of the, uh, the banker families. And um, that's pretty damning, right? It tells you that from their point of view, nothing will stop them from achieving their goal of a global government. If they need a few world wars, that's fine. They want it, right? That's where they're going. Um, but I'm just saying, if you have this technology, let's say life extension technology, right? Let's say that you can live to be 120, um, barring, you know, getting blown up, right? So you don't have to worry about cancer or heart disease or whatever. Um, you know, they might have that already, almost. You, you know, know I, I, keep, I keep waiting. I mean, I've been waiting for people like Kissinger, and, you know, there are a number of these criminals, right, that I keep saying, you know, I'm going to have a party when so-and-so dies, Right. Yeah. I'm still waiting. You know We're what I mean? My waiting. champagne is still there, right? It's getting old, as a matter of fact. Yeah. You know, th this like, is like five or six people I've been waiting, and they just, I'm starting to think they may outlast me, you know? This is getting, <laughs> you know well, I'm going to have to will, will my champagne to somebody else, but he, you know, the kids, will live to see, you know, Kissinger die or whatever, right? So I'm already getting my doubts here. But you see, the point is, you do have to wonder. <laughs> Sorry, Herm, go ahead. No, I was going to say that what you were talking about earlier reminds me of, uh, you know, one of uh, uh, the uh, late uh, Dr. Timothy Leary's uh, blur uh, little acronyms, uh, SMILE, 
with the I squared, you know, space migration, intelligence increase, and life extension. I mean, this sort of fits right in <laughs> what we were saying. Uh, anyway, um, and I wonder, and then I wonder what kind of, uh, you know, I, I wonder what kind of relationships he might have had with the three-letter agencies himself at that time. But which is a totally different topic. But well, he was so. owned by them. But that's a <laughs> but, that's <not. laughs> but you know, hey. You know, that's the way it goes. So anyway, moving on, how about the other thing that it's time to think about, which is anti-gravity? Um, I mean, really, there are two technologies that blow everything away, besides, like, infinite lifespan, right? And that would be free energy, more or less, or, you know, dirt-cheap energy or anti-gravity, right? And if you look into it, I mean, have you read um, Nick Cook's book, The Hunt for Zero Gravity? Oolong, have you read it? No, unfortunately, I haven't. I have not either. Okay, so he was a mainstream Jane's Defense Weekly kind of guy, right? A reporter. And eventually he just gets given all this information that shows that in, let's say, the mid-1950s, there was an immense amount of evidence and uh, testimony, by the way, or quotes and what have you, by researchers who were very serious aerospace guys. I mean, you know, top-level guys. That anti-gravity is just around the corner. Um, George Trimble, I mean, he was, he's, it's about to begin. The age of anti-gravity is, you know, it's about to begin. And these are some, you know, serious guys. I mean, they would be like, I don't know, in today's context, you know, Bert Rutan or somebody. Or, you know, we don't, they don't even want us to have heroes anymore in the U.S., right? So we don't have aerospace heroes anymore the way we did decades ago. But um, uh, if we did have somebody like that, you know, like in uh, ocean stuff, you have Robert Ballard, right? Um, if you had this modern guy who's like top level and he says, look, anti-gravity, you know, we got it in the lab now. It's working fine. We're going to go. This is the, you know, the economics of the planet are going to change dramatically. And then like a year later, it vanishes everywhere. No discussion. And so this author, um, Nick Cook, looked into it. And there's just a tremendous amount of evidence that they developed it, at least at a, um, what can we say, in a laboratory setting. Uh, in the late 50s, let's say from, let's say 1957, give or take. And then there's evidence that the Nazis had it by, you know, early, well, let's say late 1944 anyway. Um, now, anti-gravity, I mean, or free energy, you're changing the economics of everything, right? Everybody takes for granted, let's say, that um, you can't extract gold from the ocean, Right? because it'd be too hard. But what if you had free energy, right? And everybody says, well, you can't fly through the Van Allen belts, you know, for long because um, too much radiation. It would take a foot of lead to stop all that radiation. Now, excluding the fact that they have materials we don't know the names of, um, excluding that, if you got free energy, well, then you just carry a foot of lead, right? <laughs> What's the problem, right? I mean, right? Yeah. You know? yeah. So, it basically changes everything. And I think they've got these things. Now, I, I, I'm not going to say it's free energy, but let's just say dirt-cheap energy. Dirt-cheap energy would change the game. And as far as the anti-gravity or electrogravitics, I think they have it. I think they've used it in some of their advanced weapon systems now. Um, but... How controllable it is, I don't know. But then just take, for example, the issue of what's in the sky at night. If you take one of these, what is it, third-generation goggles, you'll see hundreds of these things flying and doing all kinds of weird things in the sky. And if, if you look into it, you'll find, uh, let's say, mm, telescope and computer and other hacker types that put things together. John uh, John Leonard Watson, I think, is uh, the name Paulson. of one fellow. Yeah, he's Paulson. he's got some he's got some amazing videos of stuff that's flying around up there that you know we we have no idea what it is. Right, and I think if you look at his stuff, for the most part, it looks like Star Wars, Star Trek. It looks like stuff that you and I could easily imagine. Um, and it do, what it doesn't look like it doesn't look like you know amoeba blobs that regrow themselves or something, right? Um, not that those don't exist, I'm just saying that, uh, and the maneuvers and all the things going on, it all looks to me like 
how about I put it this way? What if the Nazis had won World War II? What would we have now? And I'm going to say we'd have now what we do have now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was pretty much going to be my Same answer, too. Yeah, wait. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. But I guess they lost. Well, well anyway, the Germans lost. <laughs> right? I'm not sure about the Nazis. Um, so anyway, um, anti-gravity is a big deal. That, that really is, is the holy grail, so to speak. And I think they've got it, at least in a limited form. Are you familiar uh, with John Hutchinson's work, Plane? Sure. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some of the stuff he's done is uh, is quite impressive. It almost looks like an anti-gravity type effect. I mean, he's levitated bowling balls. Uh, he's fused metal and wood together. He's done just some real crazy stuff. Yes, but he's had no money. And so what he couldn't do is he couldn't do massive counter-rotation, which I think is the trick. Mm-hmm. Right. If you look into the Nazi research like this book by the Polish guy Witkowski, or um, Joseph Farrell's books on the Nazi, the Bell Project, and other things. Um, the trick was counter-rotation, and I mean very fast rotation, in an electromagnetic environment, where everything changed to hell. The whole space-time existence changed, and I mean dramatically, like things melted. I mean, melted. You know, not only that, I mean, people melted, you know what I mean? <laughs> Plants <laughs> melted, things. Amazing, like, the structure of things fell apart, is what I'm trying to say. And that Bell Project is the only project in, in World War II that the Nazis gave the highest category to. They called it uh, decisive for the war, decisive for the war effort. Right, The nuclear pro- uh, bomb, which they had, by the way, this is another long topic. They had bombs. They had the material at the end of the war. Um, they had better physicists than America. Um, and in my opinion, Japan had bombs too, but that's another topic. Because like the top Japanese physicist was close to the crowd developing it in Germany. He was one of the top physicists in the world at the time. Um, anyway... Uh, this Bell Project is the only one that was considered decisive for the war. As far as they were concerned, the nuclear bomb was just a big bomb, right? If you blow up, you know, 20 miles, that's still just a bomb that's blowing up 20 miles. Um, But if you have a Bell, which is changing time, space, and everything, right, you're talking about something that can control gravity. Anyway, from their perspective, it could like blow up the planet. So that was a much more desirable uh, technology to have than anything else. And um, this gets into all kinds of more speculative stuff after the war, the Philadelphia experiment, all kinds of things. And indeed, that continued research with that phenomenon may have been what actually happened with the Philadelphia experiment. Um, And it's pretty grim and a long story. But anyway, um, the Nazis were working on it, and I think they had uh, a reasonable, well, I wouldn't say reasonable because they lost the war, right? But they had success in developing it. And I think they developed it far more after the war. And I think that various deals got cut uh, with the U.S., which essentially led to the U.S. becoming very, very Nazified. So that, um, for example, the CIA is a merger of the OSS and the Galen organization, which was uh, Nazi intelligence uh, for the um, Eastern Europe. Um, and you think about that, I mean, why would you ever agree to give your defeated enemy essentially equal control over something that powerful? That's insane. You would never do that. Um, so that to this day, we have phenomena like uh, with 9-11, they said there was insider trading and things like that, right, on shares. And they, some people say it came out of Deutsche Bank. Who was the head of it? Buzzy Krongard. He was number three in the CIA. Why? Because his father was a top Nazi intelligence <laughs> official. <laughs> oh, I mean, actually, it's it was uh, Anyway, you get the idea. It's like it never ends. We're really... You know, they say the Roman Empire never ended. Um, the Nazis never ended. World War II never ended. Um, so, anyway, but you can see how this all essentially ends up in being a breakaway civilization. They may already have bases 
on the, let's say, Mars or something. Who knows? If you have cheap energy and effectively more or less functional anti-gravity, the sky's the limit, so to speak. And I don't think it was workable in the 1950s in a practical matter, but that was a long time ago. And John Hutchison is just a, a, a clever guy with great ideas and certain intuition that's creating these amazing things. But imagine if you had a lab with hundreds of millions of dollars behind you. Yeah, I, th I think he actually uh, did do some type of test with uh, some military agency. And uh, he was, th I, I can't remember the name, one of the science advisors that was on site with him. Uh, was basically explaining to John how a lot of this stuff was working. Like John could have the could create these effects, but I don't think he really, a hundred percent knew the science behind it. This guy was sort of explaining it to him as if it was already known. Well, at the beginning of our show, we talked a bit about the idea that with Tesla, they fund it until it's about to work, and then they stop. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, they fund all these things to know what's out there, but they already have a lot of it, if not all of it now. Um, and I think that's the case. They, they already have so much. Um, uh, there's another, uh, you, you know, looking into unusual inventors, there's an endless, uh, you know, slew of these guys. There was, um, what's his name, Bruce De Palma? His brother was a movie director, Brian De Palma, I guess. Anyway, he did... Um, research, interesting research with rotation, and essentially showed that uh, you get, I guess you would call it free energy, from spinning something as it's rotating on something and throwing it off. So something as simple as that, the textbooks don't want to talk about or let you know. Because again, this idea of rotation seems to, I don't know if you want to say um, cross dimensions or there's some point where like energy comes in and out of our world or our dimensions or something like that and um, I mean he was a serious guy an MIT guy and whatever you know he's not you know sometimes you know we've got these inventors saying they have something and they haven't got any teeth and they've got too much chewing tobacco you know what I mean you, you kind of wonder right They've, they've been arrested for fraud a few too many times, you know, that kind of thing, right? But I'm saying this was a serious guy, and, uh, and I think he, his, his research was legit. Um, rotation is, and rotation within rotation, has amazingly interesting characteristics. And if you add electricity and magnetism to it, it just, you just go into a different world of some sort. And it's easy to imagine that in all this research, thousands of, peoples may, thousands of people may have died. That wouldn't surprise me one bit. Mm. So anyway, this is kind of a you know a high level introduction to the topic. Um, uh, I mean, it's really an endless discussion because you get into the uh, actions of very powerful and important organizations and people, right? Um, just the uh, the rich people, the the modern day hearse. What are they up to, and why? Right, you can see that uh, they fund these mega boats with uh, submarines to go to the Arctic or the Antarctic and stuff like that. Right? Um, one wonders <laughs> what they're doing. Um, you know, who knows? There again, there could be bases down there. We just don't know. Um, and I suspect a lot of those things are just covers. Yeah, like, for instance, the uh, NASA plan a couple of years ago to bomb the moon. Uh, that always struck me as a real strange one. You know, I always wonder if there's more to the, the picture than meets the eye there. Yeah, and, you know, the poles have all kinds of questionable and interesting aspects to them that is really, like, worthy of its own show. Um, I was just looking today, as a matter of fact, at some... Uh, photos, you know, heat phenomena from uh, south, the South Pole. Um, as you get basically close to the real, the true, you know, North, South Pole, you get all kinds of anomalies. And, um, you know, you can't get photos very easily of any sort of the North Pole. I mean, it's uh, essentially banned by law to, you know, like satellite photos and such. Um, anyway, there are a lot of phenomena out there but you can imagine this breakaway civilization cares about or controls and therefore prevents us from playing with. Um, but it isn't, 
I guess what I'm trying to say is at the beginning, a lot of people, when they hear this idea of a breakaway civilization, they just can't imagine that it could be true, right? But if you look at the historical example of just like the mafia or, uh, you know, a, a Jewish ghetto in Eastern Europe or something. Even the Knights Templar. Right, the Knights Templar. You can see how things develop. And at some point, these guys consider themselves to be, um, what can I say? They consider us to be profane, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> to use the, t the Freemasonic term that the Knights Templar uh, use, right? Um, I, like not... the mafia. I like the Mafia one, too, but go ahead. <laughs> well, okay. uh, but anyway, and with the SS, it's the same story. And so you can see, basically, though, that I'm arguing there's this breakaway civilization, but that's not enough. We also have to think about, do they fight amongst themselves? And I would say yes, because they're basically gangsters, really. Um, and just as the mafia would fight against other mafiosi, right? Mm -hmm. Then it's no surprise that, I don't know, pick some... You know, the SS organization might fight with the, um, uh, the Zionists the or the Vatican or whatever. Right, yeah, yeah, of course. Let's say the Vatican is uh, up to its eyes in some of this stuff. Uh, or, you know, the whole broadly speaking, i not trying to make it Jewish because it's not exactly a Jewish thing, but the whole broader Rothschild-centered, Zionist-related crowd, uh, you know, they it seems to me, after World War II, had all kinds of deals with the Nazi types. The Bormann organization, they were friends for a long time. But I don't know if they're friends now. I'm not sure moving forward, because another open question with this whole breakaway civilization idea <clears throat> is that the technology may be overriding, let's say, financial power, right? Because if you just think from a high level, if you now have dirt cheap energy and some form of working anti gravity, then to what do you really need money anymore? To what extent do you need money? Right? If you were the SS and you used to in the nineteen fifties, let's say, you know, counterfeit banknotes in South America, right? Okay. That's fine. You use the money to do things. You bribe people, you know, whatever. That's, that's understandable. But once you start talking about the technology to, you know, manipulate molecules or, you know, blow up planets or whatever, go fly to Mars for free, you know, the, the issue of money may be a different one. And so, you know, the Rothschilds have always been essentially able to buy people, right? They have the money. But... I don't know, but if you're from an organization that has the technology, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, let's say the uh, the European colonizer types went around the world, right? They went to the South Pacific, and they go to some island kingdom, right? Different islands, and they, uh, you know, bribe or kill or enslave a few islands, and then they come to the next island, and the guy says, "Well, this is all my kingdom. You just like killed everybody in three of my islands, right?" And, you know, I know you're amazing, but I tell you what, I want to bribe you. I will give you, like, the best, best seashells that the South Pacific has ever had. This is our currency, right? With this, you can buy anything in the South Pacific. You will be like a god. This is, you know, the greatest seashell of, uh, in history. Well, <clears throat> you can imagine that the French and British and all those guys would have laughed at this, right? They would have pulled out their revolvers or rifles or whatever and said, we don't care about your seashells, right? You know, we want slaves to sell, you know, wherever it is, you know, for blackbirding in Australia or whatever it is they're looking for, right? And um, they would not be impressed with the seashells because they got the technology to do what they want. When you got the guns, when you got the firepower, you can just make everyone do what you want. And so there's a question by researchers of the breakaway civilization idea as to whether the guys with the guns are essentially taking over from the guys with the checkbooks. <laughs> and that is worth a whole show of contemplation, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, Cliff High's theory is that uh, the real rulers have basically gone off-world and kind of 
the mess that we have now is just you know the minion class that are trying to keep everything going and and kind of screwing it all up yeah that would be along the lines of this idea of a breakaway civilization you know out there enjoying their babylon fives and their bases on mars or whatever and uh things are going swimmingly for them right the uh the sky is uh, blue the air is clean <laughs> no star, trail. star star trek no. technology no radiation and um yeah the, nobody gets cancer you know that kind of thing and um now and then, for fun, when they're slumming it, they come back here to uh, Colosseum Earth, and they watch us kill ourselves. Um, and take genetic samples. That's important. You gotta keep and take it. Well, that's because they're obsessed with genes, right? Because <laughs> they're so ruining everything, they kind of want to like be able to rebuild it the way they want once it's all over. Right. <laughs> right. Um, now, this is all above our pay grade. We're just speculating here. But clearly you can see how there's a history of technology being suppressed, but being integrated by in secret locations. And by now, that suppressed technology is so amazingly good, it's frightening. And, you know, we can only guess what they're up to. But I also think you see in movies and other places, like this movie Elysium, you get the idea they're kind of, um, what shall we say, putting the idea out there, Right in different ways about these horrible technologies that may be coming. You can see it. It's predictive, coming. Predictive programming. Exactly. The programming is out there now. It's like, you know, this, I mean, to your grandmother, this would have been an unimaginable thought. And now here we are discussing that, uh, you know, well, they may just build some, you know, Babylon 5 settlement up in space, and they'll live like kings, and, um, well, it's too bad, but, you know, Earth, w Earth had a good run, but, you know, now it's over, right? And this is all needless, of course, because we didn't get into this, but these rulers are basically psychopathic in some sense. And I started the show with the idea of an organized irresponsibility, that quote from a, a key book called The Power Elite. And I think that's kind of the way to end it. We need to overcome this organized irresponsibility, this idea that, um, you know, the, the rich people that, they're, they're above rich. They don't have an ideology, right? Because ideology implies that they're like in the same level as us. They, they don't consider us human. <laughs> and um, we, need to, we need to have human values in all forms, including e even in wars, Right? I mean, 200 years ago, you didn't attack cities. I mean, that was immoral. Now that's what we attack first, the water supply and the cities. <laughs> I mean, we've really become, and, and totally accept the idea of Dresden as policy, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or Auschwitz as policy or whatever. You know, that's, that's the modern um, NATO uh, approach to things. And, and that, that's totally unacceptable. We need to go back to some semblance of humanity here. And uh, we need to, you know, work at taking these breakaway technologies and things and, and getting them under control and integrating them for a better future. So, anyway, that's my goal. That's my thought. Um, any other thoughts, uh, Oolong? Yeah, just a quick point. Uh, and it's, again, something that uh, I think Cliff brought up at one point was that, you know, they've perhaps also created uh, spiritual technologies. You know, we, we all know about remote viewing. And who knows how much deeper that rabbit hole goes, right? So uh, I think Cliff mentioned one time before that, you know, if they have developed these spiritual technologies, um, perhaps it's also in some sense made these some of these breakaway folks, um, you know, more spiritual or perhaps more compassionate. And, you know, perhaps they may have an interest in helping their fellow man. Well, I suspect that a lot of the people developing it are more like John D than, uh, you know, Mother Teresa. <laughs> but, but clearly, just like in the military, there are a lot of people who don't like the idea of needlessly doing bad things. And they want to see the world go to a better place. And then I think there's the other thing is that people who are in the military or the military-industrial complex or whatever, you know, they kind of enter gung-ho 
at uh, you know 20 years old or whatever. But by the time you're 30 or something, you've kind of become a lot uh, very skeptical of the way things are heading. Dis- and I'm disillusioned. Sure, I think there's a lot of disillusionment, and, and people have been at something for a while. Um, but it's possible. I think a lot of these things came from Operation Grunbaum and the Nazis. Um, a lot of the psychic stuff that we don't even know the names of. Um, and uh, that's an- <laughs> that would be another show. <laughs> another <laughs> long topic of what they were up to, because I think they were way ahead of what the Soviets had, and the Soviets were the excuse for why the Americans created all kinds of uh, you know psychic spying and what have you. Um, but be the that as it may, uh, you know, I'm sure they've been working on other things. I mean, the Nazis were working on all this, you know. I mean, they had, in addition to their Bureau of the Occult, I mean, they had teams who were doing things like visualization, visualize the Nazi takeover of Prague, for example, right? Take a picture of Prague and then, you know, superimpose and then psychically the image of the Nazi troops marching down Prague after successfully conquering it, right? Um, now, that seems kind of primitive. I mean, today, Lord knows, they have holograms <laughs> and TV and, you know what I mean? They have all kinds of things. But that's certainly true. You can imagine that they're up to this kind of thing. Uh, Herm, any thoughts? Well, I, I was just thinking about uh, what uh, you and Ruan were saying, that you know, there, there, are, there are areas uh, in that spiritual world, oh, I'm sure you can you can uh, garner a lot of power, but the, uh, but some types of power garnered that way have a lot of cost. And one of the things that just you know came into my head was, gee, I wonder if if, if any of, of this is operating now. You know, I wonder if some of that cost is some, is is sacrifice. It doesn't have to be you. You know, it could, could be. Anyone. It doesn't have to be you being the one who is engaging those powers. Um, and I, I sort of never thought of it, but um, um, I think that uh, it's if if that kind of work is going on, um, that's probably even could could potentially be even more quote earth shaking than just about anything we've talked about. I guess I, I guess maybe from my perspective, I, I know there are some. There are some things in that world uh, that that um, are quite, we would say, evil, and are quite ready to help you for a cost, which doesn't have to be yours. And I think if, if any of that stuff is going on, <laughs> I, would, um, um, I would actually be quite scared. I mean, I'm actually hoping that 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 none of that is going on, and that the only people that are exploring there are ones with a good heart, because someone with a bad heart and with that kind of personal power that can get in there it could it could literally wreak uh, a, a world of damage. That's just my thought and just what we were talking about. Well, Herm, so, I would disagree with the could. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, have, are, and will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, not ready for that yet. Plane. No, you don't think they're doing. Oh, I, I, mean, I, I, you might be right. I just, I don't want to think. I, I don't want to uh, get into mindset that you're right quite yet. <laughs> I got to think well, about. This. Okay, but come on, the um, the Nazis. I mean, the swastika is reversed. That that essentially means like, you know, live fast, die young kind of thing. You know, <laughs> go down right. in flames kind of thing. Why would you do that if that's your motto? Um, you know. And talking about playing in black magic, well, I mean, that the Nazis had institutionalized. That was, it wasn't like a little thing over to the side. That was like, right. you know, the heart of the SS. It was the Black Sun. They were, <laughs> they, they were seriously into the occult. They were, you know, they, they were beyond like, you know, dabbling or something. These guys mm-hmm. were like writing textbooks for future generations. So, mm-hmm. um, of course, it's all classified because that's part of the breakaway civilization, <laughs> <laughs> they, right? We need to get some remote viewing into uh, classified documents. You know, that would be good. That would be a good place to start. But um, well, yeah, yeah but uh, mm. you're not likely to find any volunteers. Let's just put it that way, right? Right, I understand. Uh, 
But um, anyway, though, yeah, certainly the spiritual side is out there, and, and one can bet that they're up to all kinds of things. And um, some of it might be kind of mild, like visualizing stuff, right? You know, the secret or whatever, you know. And then some of it is, of course, going to be black magic, so it just depends. But uh, the interesting thing, though, is, you know, the ancient um, Indians talked about the cities, right, the powers, that humans have, and I forget their number, but, you know, 100 and some, 125 powers or something, right? And so when we talk about five senses, that's like, well, that's because this is the Kali Yuga. This is the ultimate dark age. We actually have unlimited powers. Mm -hmm. And we could even have a show just discussing the cities, the powers, because uh, the in traditional Indian thought, humans natively, without you know, just practice makes perfect, but natively had all kinds of powers. And um, our world vision has been so smashed that we don't even uh, acknowledge them. We don't even have words for them anymore in most languages. Right. And well, I think the Gnostic Christians also believe that as well, that, 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 that humans have unlimited power and um, uh, that power comes from the fact that uh, each each human is godlike in that aspect. So, yes, yes. you know, so it's not only Indian, but I mean, I think I think that I, I think that idea is both in East and West, right? Yeah, but I think the Indians had it very clear. I mean, they listed here are the 125 mm -hmm. senses, or whatever, essentially, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. we're, st we're supposedly stuck with five, <laughs> right? Right. And that's like, boy, this really is a dark age. I mean. Right, if that's the most you can come up with, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, I could, you know, I could come up with twenty without even trying, you know, you know what I mean? Like countless uh, senses. But anyway, um, so let's close it on that note and uh, just say this was an intro. That's all it was. We could uh, discuss this for a long, long time. But the the idea is that there's a lot of evidence for a breakaway civilization, and uh, let's see if we can't um, take that and and make our civilization better so that's it for this time take care everyone okay thank you plan thanks gentlemen